welcome. I'm Sue Perlgut, co-founder of It's All Right to Be Woman Theater. And I'm Jessica Delvecchio, Assistant Professor of Theater at James Madison University in Virginia. Welcome to the second of our three-part panel series on feminist theater, past and present. Six months ago, I reached out to Jessica with an idea for a panel that would bring together feminist theater artists to talk about their work. As Jessica and I brainstormed artists to invite, one panel morphed into three. And this is the second of the panels. We enlisted the help of Dr. Sarah Warner, who connected us with the extraordinary E. Cornell to bring this vision, our vision, to life. We hope that the conversations engendered in these panels will give audiences a sense of the trajectory of feminist theater in the U.S. over the past several decades. Our aim is to celebrate the artists of the past and to inspire feminist performance of the future. We really would like to thank the Performing and Media Arts Department at Cornell, James Madison University, Close to Home Productions, and the Women in Theater Program for their support. And now, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Sarah Warner, Associate Professor of Performing and Media Arts and the current director of the LGBT Studies Program at Cornell University. Good evening, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here, and I had the um, pleasure of moderating the first panel. I want to thank Sue and Jessica for inviting me to be part of their series. Uh, the event tonight is part of a year-long celebration marking the 30th anniversary of LGBT studies at Cornell and the 50th anniversary of feminist gender and sexuality studies, formerly women's studies, uh, here at Cornell. And we are proud to have among our uh, alumni um, Tony Award and Pulitzer Prize winning uh, dramatist Paula Vogel, who was an early member um, of the Women's Studies Department and an instructor there as well. Uh, please visit our website for a full list of anniversary um, events. I'd like to make a land acknowledgement. Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayukono, the Cayuga Nation. The Gayukono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on the land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of the Gayukono, dispossession, and honor the ongoing connection of the Gayukono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. We would also like to acknowledge the lands on which our panelists and our audiences appear this evening. I am pleased to introduce our moderator for tonight's panel, Elisa Solomon, a professor at Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism, where she directs the MA Concentration in Arts and Culture. A longtime staff writer at The Village Voice, Elisa is also a theater critic, dramaturg, and award-winning author, most recently of the critically acclaimed book, Wonder of Wonders, A Cultural History of Fiddler on the Roof. I invite you to view uh, Lisa's uh, complete bio on our website and to join me in welcoming her tonight. Uh, thank you so much, Sarah, um, and welcome everyone. It's um, such a pleasure to be here, and I want to add my thanks to Sue and Jessica as well for the invitation to participate tonight, um, and also extend my thanks to Chris Tracy and Nicholas Phillips for their labor and expertise on the production side of things. Uh, I'm honored and excited to be moderating a conversation this evening among four artists whose work I have followed and admired literally for decades. Um, all of them have been formative for me as a critic, a scholar, and especially as a person, um, I would say. Um, I came to New York in the early 1980s, fresh from a very traditional graduate program in theater, where in three years of coursework, every single one of my professors um, was a white cis man and almost all of them a straight white man. And they couldn't fathom why I was interested in plays by Carol Churchill in 1980, 81, um, and much less interested in what was about to blow my mind uh, at places like the Wow Cafe um, and elsewhere in those heady years. So I feel like I'm deeply imprinted um, on these artists um, that are on this panel tonight, um, gracing us with their presence this evening. Uh, they've all made, in their own ways, pioneering, profound, funny, savvy, um, patriarchy-busting creations. And 
they've been continuing for many years to invent new forms, to do something different when, you know, the thing they already, you know, they had something uh, new to say, to continue delivering insightful commentary, to push audiences to think and to laugh and to marvel at the many and various ways a brave woman on a stage can evoke such powerful responses. So given their illustrious histories and the happy fact that they're all still incredibly productive, um, we're going to be talking about the past, the present, and the future. Um, so there, there's a lot to pack in. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm not going to read you their extensive biographies containing the long lists of their many achievements, accolades, and awards. Um, I refer you to the website as well uh, for those. So quickly, I'll just identify them um, briefly. Um, so alphabetically by patronyms. Uh, Mo Angelos is, among other things, a member of the WOW Cafe since 1981. Um, she's one of the troupe um, called the Five Lesbian Brothers. And she's a collaborator with the multimedia performance company, the Builders Association, among many other things. Uh, Marga Gomez is known for solo performance and stand-up comedy and for her much anthologized writing. She's also a teacher and she's a tenured artist in residence at Brava for Women in the Arts in San Francisco. Deb Mark Olin, teacher, playwright, actor, founding member of the Split Bridges Theatre Company. She's the author of numerous plays, including Imagining Madoff and Bringing the Fisherman Home, as well as 10 solo performance plays, which she has toured throughout the United States. And Carmelita Tropicana, um, also an early denizen of the WOW Cafe and performer in the East Village club scene of the 80s. Carmelita, a.k.a. Alina Troiano is a writer and performer in various forms in media, film, essays, variety show MC, podcasts, and in various guises, human and animal. Um, like our co-panelists tonight, she's an all-around culture hero. So welcome, everyone. I'd like to start by building something of a bridge to, or, 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 or maybe a gulf um, from the terrific panel in the series two weeks ago that I hope um, many of the, the people tuning in tonight had the opportunity to watch. Um, it featured pioneers of feminist theater of the 1970s. So here's my question. How aware were you uh, when you were coming up and venturing into the theater of the work of troops like uh, It's All Right to Be a Woman Theater, At the Foot of the Mountain, Caravan, Women's Experimental Theater, and so forth? Were they influential for you at all as inspirations for what you wanted to do or even as a foil for working out what you didn't want to do? Um, and if not the feminist groups, or in, a, in addition to them, um, what inspirations did you have? Uh, were you setting out to make explicitly feminist work, and what did that mean to you? So, Margaret, I'm going to I'm going to throw this to you first because I know that um, you, you, you mentioned uh, that you were <laughs> that you were um, in a, something calling itself a feminist troupe in your in your youth. Uh, Thanks, Elisa, and thanks for all the work you have um, put into put uh, getting us wrangling us. <laughs> um, yeah, well, it's it's weird because when I was uh, invited to the panel, I thought, oh, um, but I really didn't start uh, my solo theater work until the '90s, and then I totally forgot. Uh, everything that happened prior to that, late '70s and early '80s, and I believe it might have been marijuana, but but you know I'm not endorsing it at all. But it might have been. So uh, when I was in uh, college uh, in the '70s, uh, somehow, somehow. I don't know if I went to meet Sue at West Beth or I saw a performance of It's All Right to Be a Woman Theater, but um, I was getting involved in, um, I was, it, you know, it was one of those things where you have to have a lesbian affair to graduate at my college. I was in that kind of school and um, I got involved with, you know, very, the women's, uh, the women's center and all. And then I thought, oh, let's, uh, let's do a play together. And I got a script from It's All Right to Be a Woman Theater. And we performed that on the street, on, on, on campus. And they, they were very radical. And we even, we even made t-shirts uh, that said, we are the women uh, your father warned you against or something. I don't know who we stole that from, Robin Morgan, perhaps. So that was actually my first encounter with what we know of as feminist theater. Uh, and then uh, when I, I kind of 
dropped out of college, went to San Francisco, where there was this amazing queer, feminist, BIPOC uh, counterculture art scene. I wound up, have, has, I mean, just by happenstance, joining a feminist theater company at 20 called Lilith Theater, which, is, uh, which also kind of crosses paths with Martha Bosings at the foot of the Mountain Theater. Uh, we wound up going on tour in Europe. I'm 20 years old, never thought I'd get to Europe, uh, you know, until I was older. And uh, we were being toasted and fed by leaders of, of cities all over, you know, all over theater festivals uh, in Europe. Uh, and of course, we learned, unlike uh, the United States, how theater was supported and how feminist theater was revered. So it was a very great start to my, um, my mindset as a performer. Um, and, uh, and, and that was Lilith Theater, so I do want to drop their name. They, they, uh, they started in the late 70s and continued into the 80s. Uh, Terry Baum and Carolyn Meyer, the original founders, are still uh, presenting and performing around the country and, and the world. Um, so that was, um, that's kind of, uh, that was a very big building block in my career. Great. Thank you so much. Um, that's, that's amazing. So you, you were out on the West Coast. I don't know if the scene in New York um, was, was considerably different from that. Um, Deb, let's turn to you. What about you and your sense of, you know, feminist theater um, when you were start, starting out and how you um, found a place in it? Wow. I'm going to spit out my gum for this. Um, oh. You know, I, I was just, I, I was just this young weirdo who loved language. They, I'm so old, I didn't even know women wrote anything. They never told us that. You know, uh, you read, maybe you read Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf. Maybe. Okay. So I just thought I was Henry Miller. Um, and I got some job writing about cosmetic products, which I'm allergic to, for Beauty <laughs> Fashion Magazine. Okay. Then I ran into this weird man who thought he was, he literally thought he was Jesus Christ. Um, and he had this theory that if you marry somebody whose birthday, you have to marry someone whose birthday is exactly six months from yours. And mine was from his. So he was considering me for holy matrimony. And he hired me to write up his thesis about how you have to marry somebody, whatever. The one messianic thing he did do for me was take me to see women's experimental theater project doing Electra Speaks. Okay, I cannot overemphasize the extent to which this changed my life. On every level, from skin to soul, this changed my life. These were women who, they were, did not try to pretend they were Gina Lola Brigida. These were women looking at the events in the house of Atreus from the women's perspective. They stood there in normal, like sort of potato sack outfits like I'm wearing right now, <laughs> and they were profound. I have two images that stay with me to this day. One of them was Mary Lum, the very beautiful Mary Lum, playing Iphigenia, whose father called for her to get married, hopefully to someone whose birthday was six months from hers. But when she got there, they, he chopped her head off to make the winds favorable. And she sat there for five straight minutes doing this. Get married, get married, get married, get married, get married, get married, get married. I, I was sobbing from this image without knowing why. I never saw anything like this. And then, of course, Sandra Siegel, the, the beautiful, beautiful performer, Sandra Siegel, drew a line, who played Electra, drew a line an invisible line with her foot and stepped over it and stood there. You know, when the lights come up on a woman on stage, it is a radical act. I, this is when I, I saw this. I could not have put into words what happened to me in this performance. The other thing that happened was that my friend Nobbs, who had stopped speaking to me for a year, came back into my life um, to tell me that she had become involved in theater. She didn't want to tell me about it because, because she knew I tended to send up things I didn't understand. So when she got her bearings, she came back into my life and told me she had become 
the business manager, among other things, for Spider Woman Theater. And she took me to see them in a show called An Evening of Disgusting Songs and Pukey Images. <laughs> now, here again, some radical stuff was going on. These were women who were 60, women who were 20, women who weighed 300 pounds, women who weighed 80 pounds, lesbian women, straight women, women of color, was founded by three Native American women. These were lesbian women, straight women. This was a panoply of women, such as you have not seen. And they were incredibly funny. They were brilliantly theatrical, and they were making theater out of the interstitial moments of their own lives. They had assumed that their lives were worthy of artistic expression. This is a radical thing. I never saw that. I thought it was Henry Miller. No one told me that I had the right to speak. I cannot tell you what this did. So then the spider women started making fun of me because that's what they do. They And, you know, when people make fun of you, it's so intimate. You know, respect is very far away and distant and like a snow-covered mountain. But the insult is up in your face. It's intimate. So they <laughs> like to dance with me and make fun of me and stuff. And then, of course, that's where I met my colleagues in the Split Riches Theater Company, Peggy Shaw and Lois Weaver, who were members of that company uh, at the time. And the next thing you know, I was writing material for the eponymous Split Bridges play. And then the next thing you know, I was touring Europe, um, sleeping in squatters' apartments with Mo. <laughs> um, I was, next thing I know, I was in the play. So this is, the whole thing just snowballed. The, and then I saw It's All Right to Be Woman Theater Company also was a foundational part of my life. I, I saw them sort of after I had seen these other two companies. And once again, there was this insistence upon the female body, the female voice, the story, the right to stand there. So that's what happened to me. It was a crazy thing. Great. Thanks. So the, the right to stand there, the right to speak, um, really essential and astonishing um, events. Um, Carmelita, what was your... Kind of exposure or, um, you know, how, how did you get into this racket? I am ashamed <laughs> <laughs> because I am ignorant and I'm a really late bloomer. I was one of those people that had heard about feminism, but I really, you know, I was like really, um, I'd like to say that I grew up in Queens and it was like if I'd been in a coma, I would be more alive. So... Um, <laughs> So I, here I was, you know, not knowing, I mean, I'd taken courses, at, you know, at Queens College, and then I went to HB Studios, and I went, you know, also did uh, stuff at Circle in the Square, but I didn't know, I didn't think that I would be hired as an actor. An actor was the most I could possibly hope for. But in terms of feminism, I thought, oh, I bought into the man's uh, idea of feminism, which was not funny, not fun, you know, strict rigid and angry. And then um, I go to a party, this woman scribbles on my arm, really cute, you know, that there was a, 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 a show happening at, at you know, a, called the Women's One World Festival and told me where to go. I, you know, had my arm, I said, I'm going there. Because at the same time too, I was looking to see, am I a lesbian, am I not? Am I bi, am I not, you know? But really, I was looking for girls when I went to WOW. Uh, and I found something more long-lasting, which is theater. Uh, so <laughs> I went to theater. I went to, you know, the WOW Cafe. Not the WOW Cafe. It wasn't the WOW Cafe yet. But I went to the, uh, the festival. And to me, just like what Deb is saying, well, I wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for Split Bridges. I wouldn't be. It was like the most amazing piece of theater because I thought that I had only seen um, last summer at Bluefish Cove. I'd seen uh, the Ridiculous Theater Company, but nothing, you know, it was, things were good, but they weren't like, whoa, and this is about me. Even though it was about three women in West Virginia, you know, outliers all. And I, you know, as a Cuban American, I'm going like, oh my God, they're talking about me. They're talking about, you know, my life, which had nothing to do. But when people criticize saying that, um, 
something is too specific to Cuban or to this or to that, really, you have to be that specific in order to be universal. And when Deb, you know, and Lois and Peggy, which were split bridges, they just did this stuff. And I thought, oh, my God, this is the funniest thing that I've ever heard. This is pithy. This is poignant. This is a just, you know, mind blowing. And of course, when they opened the cafe, I had to follow. But, you know, it was that. And at wow, it really was where I learned to write. Um, I became a feminist, I became a thespian, and I became a lesbian. And really my political, um, you know, mindset was open because I understood that feminism was not a one thing. It wasn't singular, it was plural. And feminisms, you know, at, you know, in terms of, wow, it was really open and really fun. It was joyful. And that's what I loved about it. And Mo, wow, wow was really a, a way in for you as well. I've heard you talk in the past about um, uh, sort of running up against what you recognized as certain limitations for the possibility of a theater career when you were a student. Um, and I wonder if you could you could uh, elaborate on that for us. Yeah, so uh, wow is also going to be the gateway drug experience here. Um, but uh, in uh, I was going to drama school in the in 1980 and um new york city was really crappy and um drama school was not but it was uh sort of like what you were talking about deb it was um a conservatory uh approach that was training me for this very um heightened uh kind of classical theater and uh so I was being groomed <laughs> to be, uh, you know, Nora in Doll's House, Laura in Glass Menagerie. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm not Laura or, or, or Nora, you know. So, so where was I in uh, the theater in those stories? And uh, I guess I could say I was, I was hidden in plain sight like um, Ralph from Green Acres uh, who... <laughs> Uh, was, uh, you know, a carpenter uh, presenting as male with his brother, Alf, because nobody would hire a woman carpenter in those days on that sitcom. <laughs> so um, I don't know. I don't know what, what, whatever I was thinking. I was certainly thinking that I wasn't Nora or Laura, but, uh, but I might be Ralph, right? I could be closer to Ralph. So um, I left school and I headed east uh, to 13th Street to live. And then on a tip from Sarah Schulman, who I had been arrested with the year before, but like who hasn't, right? Um, I showed up at the, wow, the Women's One World Festival headquarters at 7th Street and Avenue A. It is now called um, Miss Lily's 7A. If anybody's following my path at home on Street View, I hope you are. Uh, and uh, there I met Deb, who is in another little Zoom box right here. And uh, Deb was with her amazing comrades, Peggy and Lois, as the company Split Bridges. I saw them do that piece of theater, Split Bridges, and I thought, wow, okay. Uh, this is, I, I get this, this I understand. This is, this theater speaks to me. And uh, the, the uh, my predecessors, you know, who's on whose shoulders we stand, um, the other companies, I, I, I was aware of them, but I didn't, I didn't see their work, except I think that um, women's experimental theater, I think Sandra um, performed at WOW, if I'm not mistaken, I'll have to talk to her about that, but, uh, so, um, yeah, uh, WOW was super, super important to me. It's how I, um, how I started making theater and making it, not just being in it. And I, I don't mean to belittle that because just being in a show is a totally incredible skill that, you know, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, I'm better at being in things that um, I have my uh, hand in. And I guess feminism was kind of like the mother tongue of, wow, we didn't necessarily talk about it. Like we're making a feminist theater piece. It was just sort of all these feminisms that Carmelita 
spoke of, they were swirling around us and we lived in them. So. All right. Well, let's look at, let's look at a couple of clips of, of work that I think, you know, fits in this, uh, this feminist category. And, and that um, I think very, consciously and conscientiously um, uses different kinds of um, humor to upend um, stereotypes or expectations or to, you know, to, to burst open some expectations to um, maybe look at the ways that all of us are allergic to cosmetics. <laughs> um, so um, let's start. We have a clip of gestation um, by Deb Markle. Um, Deb, can, do you want us to look at it first and then talk about it, or do you want to set it up for us in any way? Um, well, I'll just say that I was nine months pregnant and could have given birth right there. It, people saw me and ran. I gained 50 pounds. It was scary. People were afraid they were going to have to deliver a baby. So both to- I wrote a piece called Gestation. It shouldn't be a total loss. You know, why not make theater about it? This was what Sue Pearlgut taught me, Sandra Siegel taught me, Spider Woman taught me. Make theater about uh, that comes from your life. So I wrote this play called Gestation. It was a lot of it was about insomnia because I couldn't sleep for nine months, really, ever. But I, at, the clip you'll see is me in a skin tight dress as a pregnant prostitute. Let's it get freaked out the men so profoundly. I was trying to pick up a guy in the audience. The women laugh. You hear, you will hear a man laugh, but it's the kind of laughter of taxi. Can I get the F out of here right now? That's what you'll hear. You'll hear at the end. <laughs> um, okay, great. Yeah. Let's look, let's watch. Um, do roll it, please. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> It's nice to see you tonight. How are you all? Mm. You look nice to me. All of you look really nice to me. How you doing? <laughs> oh, you looking at my dress? You like my dress? <laughs> yeah, I like tight things. Fits me like a glove, don't it? Mm, I like that. Yeah. Ooh, ooh, ooh. It is a sultry evening tonight. Hey, what are you doing here? You want a party? I got a lovely place right over here. You can see it from here. You're worried about him. Oh, don't. He is very discreet and he loves meeting new people. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Yeah, that is a that, that is a good description of the the kind of laughter, um, Deb. Um, where, where did you perform this piece and, you know, how long were you able to do it? I did it twice because I got pregnant again. I thought I'm not going to be able to do this again. So let me just put the show up again, once again in the ninth month. Um, I did, this was, I think the clip you see is from Theater Club Funambul, this little joint where even if you're five, four, you hit your head on the ceiling on Ludlow Street. Um, it was, uh... I don't, I don't know what it's become now. Um, and uh, that show, the clip that you just showed, was performed and filmed at 1 o'clock in the morning. Um, what do you think is so, what do you think freaks people out about the idea of a very pregnant woman being sexual? Like what's, you know, that's, that's the taboo. That's the thing you're pushing on here. Um, that makes it both funny and a little scary, right? Um, what is that? What is that actually about? Do you think it is? Um, I think uh, for me, it is a powerful subset of the female body taking um, and are insisting on the female body. Um, I I never. I stand, as Mo said, on the shoulders of women who demonstrated for me the fact that I had the right to stand there. It was that, that um, I will just say, not for anything, that pregnancy is an unbearably sexual time of life. 
You know, you have incredible hormones. You 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 would you would make out with a chicken if it walked by. It's just you know, and the what I inherited then from my foremothers, from It's All Right to Be Woman, from Women's Experimental Theater, Spider Woman, was uh, my right to talk about that. Um, it is it is terrifying. The female body, what is that? Uh, vagina dentata, you know, the terror of the female body. You know, it's the read it and weep school of presentness on stage. And it is not angry. It is joyous. It is loving. It is insistent. And it is therefore radical. To this day, it remains radical. When the lights come up, And I am standing there, I'll just speak for myself right now, I don't look like Gina Lola Brigida, I'm allergic to the makeup products, read it and weep, read it and laugh. You know, it's that perpendicularity, you know, of entertainment versus um, that which has not been traditionally considered an attraction, shall we say. And particularly a a big, fat, pregnant lady, it was, and trying to pick up the men, I cannot describe to you. I wish the camera could have been turned around. So, I mean, even the women were a little jittery about it, but the men, I almost had to call an ambulance for that one guy. Well, this is a perfect segue to the clip we have um, from a piece of Marga's um, that also addresses the question of the comportment of the female body on stage from a very different um, um, perspective and, um, you know, with, with a, different kind, a different kind of humor, um, I'd say. So, Marga, do you want to set up um, the, the, uh, your clip? clip? Um, <laughs> Yeah, or should sure. we just watch it first, or, or what do you think? Um, I think I, I'd like to um, say that, um, again, I uh, began uh, the life I have now as a solo performer in uh, 1991, uh, and I've been bouncing back between San Francisco and New York, which um, has um, a very... It was just a very, very close uh, vibe, uh, both communities. And, you know, I met many of the people that uh, are on this panel uh, there. Um, I was, uh, so I had gone from theater uh, in the uh, uh, in the early 80s. And by the way, I also want to give a shout out to Spider Woman, because when I was touring with Lilith in Europe, um, they were the most fun to hang out with and the most exciting to watch with Spider Women. Um, so I, uh, I wound up doing solo performance um, because I had always wanted to write about uh, my parents um, because they were Latino artists in New York in the 60s. And, uh, you know, this was a community and an art form that ev- ev- eventually vanished uh, as as I experienced it, um, and my mother became ill, uh, and I had been doing stand-up comedy, and I I started meeting people who were doing solo performance, solo autobiographical performance. So this is uh, the first solo piece I've ever done. I was a little bit <laughs> green on stage. I think I'd hit my head on the bathroom stall, uh, that particular performance at the public theater. And um, yeah, and then it's 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 pretty simple. I I uh, I loved my mother. I worshipped her. She was very very feminine. That was she w- she worked, um, so she had a career. But her career was in show business, and to be, you know, to be just a femme fatale, a bombshell. And I was always this little uh, this little uh, tomboy, this uh, masculine presenting kid. Uh, who wanted her her love, and so this is this is the time. I think I'm going to get it. We go on a picnic. Great, let's and roll then that. I made please, a mistake. Chris. I tripped over a rock and I fell on the picnic bag. There was a small explosion, which meant that the potato chips were crushed. My mother blamed me because I wasn't holding the picnic bag right, like a lady. And so there, in the middle of Central Park, and in front of everyone. My mother began to give me lady lessons. This is how you hold a buggy book. Mirame. Mirame. 
This is how you walk with a pocketbook. First, it's like a, a string is pulling you up and everything is straight. Huh? Then you walk with one leg in front of the other, one leg at a time, Margita. You walk like, like you're gliding on a cloud, like this. Glide, 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 and turn. Glide, glide, glide. Now you, no, <laughs> not like that, no, 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 Marga Gomez, I really think that I'm going to have to send you to charm school, yes, I'm going to take this dime, and I'm going to call the people from charm school, and they are going to come and get you, <laughs> as if a string had entered my body, and yanked me up really hard, my back straightened, my little shoulders went back, and I began to walk like a lady. Glide, glide, glide. <laughs> I've never been able to recapture this. <laughs> now you're cooking. You see how easy that was. I'm proud of you. What a difference, la, la, la. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's, uh, it's... You know, a lot of hair. There's, there's, it's a lot yeah, of hair. There's a lot of hair, definitely. And, uh, and a lot of satire. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, as you were, as you were just talking about, a, a kind of assertion of Latinidad um, in a period when, which maybe still, <laughs> you know, the, the, the eternal, um, it seems, state of um, the theater, the feminist theater, the theater in general, was very white. Um, and I wonder if, if you might, um, you and, and Carmelita, um, especially talking about being a Cuban American in, in this space, um, what some of the, the challenges and the lights of bringing your whole self into, you know, particularly as you are starting to work in a genre of autobiography of, um, of bringing yourself into these, um, white dominant theater spaces. So I mean, Carmelita, we might look at a couple of um, still images. Um, you you created characters who just pushed the stereotypes to like wild extremes. Um, Carmelita Tropicana, we come to know and love you by this name, um, is a persona that you created with you know in a tight dress and bedecked with fruits. Um, and then uh, her male counter counterpart, Pingalito. Um, could could you tell us a little bit about the um, the genesis of those characters and what you were, you know, yeah, what, what um, they them. Okay, well, um, I was at WOW, and at WOW, um, everybody wanted you to do everything. I mean, Peggy Shaw said, get up on stage and do it. That was one person. Then uh, there was, um, uh, Holly Hughes was wonderful because I'd been in her show, uh, the Will of Horniness, and she invited a lot of people into the space. And one of the people she invited was um, Margaret Smith, who was a comedian and who wanted to teach comedy. As a matter of fact, Marga was the first, Marga and Rena were the first um, comedy, you know, first comedians I ever saw stand up live. I'd never seen anybody live until I saw them. So, again, a late bloomer, but... Uh, it was really uh, at wow that, you know, Margaret Smith was teaching a comedy. I didn't, you know, I didn't want to take the comedy course, but she said, I need at least four people. If I don't have four people, then I don't teach the class. I was the fourth person. She was cute. I ended up staying after work, after class, you know, so it all worked out really well, but I was really frightened to be, because I'd never written comedy. I didn't know what the hell uh, this is about, but she said, well, you know, if you're too afraid of going up on stage, just build a character. And I said, oh, I can build a character and be a character. Great, great. You know, okay, I'll come up with a character. At the same time that I was doing that, The Will of Horniness was being done at the, um, WBAI Live. And it was a radio show. We were all there live. And all of a sudden, the clock is ticking. I'm working with the city of New York. I'm thinking, you know, do I want to be identified as Alina Troiano? As No, no, because who can be hearing this? I could be the next mayor of the city of New York. 
No, I cannot do that. So if only, if only. Yes. So I, so I said, no, no, no. I, I need a name. I need a name. The clock was ticking. I go, uh, um, something uh, uh, Spanish. Okay, Carmelita. Um, Trop- tra- 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 Tropicana. And that was it. And it really was a name that came from spontaneous combustion, and it really worked in both um, both cultures. So it's Cuban American. You know, it was Tropicana was the um, most popular cl- nightclub in Cuba, and Tropicana orange juice we all know as a popular juice. And all and all that that conjures up is that ooh, light, wonderful. But the fruit- wasn't, sorry, wasn't that also the one Anita Bryant was representing? Yes. Exactly. So it, it all like brought it in. And the funny thing was that, you know, when I wore the fruit, people said, oh, my God, you know, stereotype, stereotype, you're doing coochie coochie. And I'm going, but look at what I'm talking about. What Latina stereotype can possibly be if I'm talking about being a lesbian? I'm talking about gentrification. I'm talking about, about performance art. What the what what is this? So, I, you know, but it took a while to understand that the fruits were just a, a different image. And when I spoke, it was something else altogether. So, and Pingalito came from the opposite of, you know, seeing all these men that were part of our culture and being a macho, but you know, there, he's also a charmer. I mean, people said, oh my God, I love this guy. And what's his name? Pingalito, meaning little dick. And so, you know, that was, you know, so, and you could, you know, somebody was saying that you could understand when people laugh at, you know, and you're reading the crowds. Well, I knew that there were Latins in the audience when they laugh at these jokes and, you know, Americans laughing at these jokes. And sometimes they all laugh at the same thing. So you had a show, I don't, I don't know the exact year, maybe, maybe you or Mo remembers, um, Memorial de la Revolución. 19, and it, 19, 87. 87. Okay. And in it, there's a song performed yes. by a number of uh, performers who went on to become the Five Lesbian Brothers, not only, but some of them, including Mo. Yes. And, and they're singing, Just we have no bananas. Like, in, I can't even do it. They're singing it in this, like, ridiculous accent. They're all Anglo white ladies. There's even a, like, Hispanic slur in the song. So yeah. how could you get away with that? Mo, and, you know, Mo, maybe Mo, you want to jump in there as well. I don't know, Margaret, if you saw that. Like, how could you even get away with that, what you were thinking? Could you get away with it now? Um, what, you know, what is, the, what is the critique that's happening in that, I think, still hilarious piece? Uh, well, I'll just say that to me, identity is kind of fluid and I make fun of even what you think of a Latin is by casting all these Anglo white women doing all these, you know, panoply of different accents. I think that is great. It's like all of a sudden everybody's trying to be something that they're not and everybody is gender bending. So Mo, maybe you, you know, how did you feel? Well, it was a tremendous amount of fun. I'll say that. (laughs) And um, very affectionate, I think. And so I, I played uh, Machito, the little macho, Tropicana, Carmelita's brother, who, um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not Latinx, I'm not Cuban, I'm not a cis guy, but um, I was making fun of all of those things in this like very loving way. Like Machito is like a poet waiter. (laughs) He's a lover, you know, he's like, he's got a, he's got a poetic soul. Right. And, uh, (laughs) and uh, you know, he also ends up being like a sort of um, non-consensual revolutionary sidekick um, in Carmelita's, uh, you know, origin story. So, um, and all of it, you know, all of it from the top to the bottom is drag. And yes, I'm sure we offended people. I'm sure we would offend people now. And I contend that that is part of the purview of drag to bring the travesty. What is the travesty? So, um, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Some of the characters are there, you know, we can say, oh, she's got an accent, but you know, you could also say, 
they're dramatic and that accent could be you know switched with any kind of regional accent in the united states so uh i think that we share the desire to create vivid characters and great stories and the fact that uh that uh, that we go back to our our life and times and the influences and even if they were some of some of it was surreal and some of it was imagination and some of it was exactly the way it was lived. Um, it's still you know we still have the license to kind of pump everything up, and uh, and then things change you know over time and we're in a very sensitive period of time now with portrayals. Um, back in the uh, back in the eighties, I got a lot of shit for you know uh, playing with stereotypes and satire. Uh, I meant to say after my clip that um, I've always known working. Uh, you know, out in the margins. I've always, I mean, that's how I've always worked. I've never really tried to break into white theater. Even the public theater was always, it was, you know, uh, George C. Wolfe was running it. So there was always um, a diversity and inclusion. And when I went to uh, the West Coast, there were theater uh, troops like Culture Clash. And uh, San Francisco had many, many uh, Latino, uh, Latinx uh, theater companies. So, yeah, it still always comes down to great character, great story. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Um, Deb, and Deb, I think that um, you, you know, I like that. I love that image of, you know, milking it, <laughs> um, um, pumping it. In, in every way. And I think, Deb, in, in your work with Split Bridges, um, Jewishness was was a very marked kind of difference. I, I remember the first time I saw Split, Split Bridges in Upper Wee Mobile Home, um, three of you singing, you know, I Like to Be in America, which was this, like, in Yiddish, which was this hilarious reversal of a song written by a closeted gay Jewish guy imagining badly Puerto Rican ideas, you know, sort of coming back into uh, what might have been the original <laughs> in, in a way. Um, how, you know, how, how does, how does um, Jewishness as difference matter to you in, in the work that you started in the 80s and all the way through? I know that's a big question for like well, a one-foot it, answer. It's a great but. question. I mean, uh, it's a complicated question. The I like to be in America in Yiddish, seriously, is I think one of the funniest things I've ever done on stage. Split bridges, we had this, the, we ran a theater of desire where if you had the impulse to do something, you sort of trusted that that impulse was going to be revelatory. And it always was. You know, if you really are hot to do something, there's a meaning to that. And since, you know, we go to the theater to see the human being, you know, so I have this yen. I knew it was going to be really funny to sing I Like to Be in America in Yiddish. I Like to Be in America is about, I mean, as you said, uh, a closeted person's idea of what it was like to be uh, Latino, Latinx. So here we have diaspora on top of diaspora, you know, much less Peggy and Lois, with love and respect to them, could not pronounce these words. You know, they <laughs> couldn't say them. And the translations themselves were so demented. They were done by my mother's friend, Laura Goldberger, and my grandmother. I really had very little regard for literal language. I, I won't go into it now, but the translations were funnier than anyone knew because nobody spoke Yiddish. But anyway, uh, in Split Bridges, it was interesting. I felt like one of the, one of the really, one of the ways in which we were given a gift by those who came before us in feminist theater we didn't talk about, as you were saying, I think, Carmelita, we didn't talk about how incredible it was that we were, but just to see the three of us on stage together was insane. Like, we really didn't even look like we belonged on the same planet, much less on the same stage. Bunch of weirdos. And um, I, Peggy and Lois were able to, without talking about it, punching it on the face, here we are. We are lesbians. That's how it is. There's a couple of lesbians here. Not only are there a couple of lesbians, but we're in a couple. 
So they were lesbians. So I was Jewish. Okay, that was my identity. I was just a big Jew, which I am. Um, and so I really ceded this sort of gendered space to the kind of radical work they were doing. And I took on, I, I explored my Jewish identity, um, including, we. I don't know, Elisa or anyone, if you saw um, Beauty and the Beast. Right. So in Beauty and the Beast, I played a Hasidic rabbi. That was a show in which we discussed trying to love people who may have oppressed us. So for Peggy, it was older women. She always wanted to be with an older woman. So she played Gussie Umberger, an old lady. Lois was always falling in love with little preacher's wives who would have fainted at the sight of a lesbian as if it was a cockroach on a fancy dinner table. So she played this little Salvation Army lady with the accordion or something. And I played this Hasidic rabbi with, I had the things and the thing and everything in it. Um, because they always prayed, thank you, God, for not making me a woman. And, and, and there's this whole, I mean, it, with orthodoxy of any kind, the first thing to go is the rights and dignity of women. Women, that's the first thing to go. So I played one of those. And there again, my role was to be not them. They were themselves because I was not them. So um, my Jewishness really played um, for an, it was my identity place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, right. I went on in my life to explore uh, Jewishness in both in my plays and my solo work. Um, it's a, you know, it's just uh, part of, you know, my identity truly. Um, in Split Bridges context, it was feminist, and it was um, designed to give them the place to work on a gendered ide uh, identity. Uh -huh. Thanks. Um, let's let's talk a little bit more about um, the queerness um, of this work. Um, that's really you know interesting kind of way that Jewishness is a different kind of queerness in that yes in that, in that Thank context. You. Um, and uh, we have um, we have a clip from. Um, from the five lesbian brothers, um, from uh, Mo, and then we also have one from a piece that um, uh, Marga and Carmelita did together. That I think um, uh, tell us something about the kind of represent queer representation that was available at the time, and really how how radical it was not not only to be a woman on stage in her body um, asserting herself, um, but also a queer woman asserting herself um, as such on the stage. Um, so this is a this this first clip is from Brave Smiles, um, which kind of I, I think you know makes fun of the genre of the tragic lesbian, uh, which was seemed to be the only genre that existed by right. just sort of piling one uh, uh, horrible cliche upon <laughs> another. Um, Mo, do you want to set up the clip for us, please? Uh, sure. This is uh, from Act One. It is at the Tilu Pusenheimer Academy, which is the <laughs> girls' school somewhere in Europe, where these young um, teens are in school together, and they are getting ready for bed. And um, their hot school teacher, Miss Phillips, comes in to wish them all good night. Roll it. Are in Paris. <laughs> That's not true. It is so. Shh, she's coming. <laughs> Good evening, girls. <laughs> Good night, damn well. Good night, Miss Phil. <laughs> <laughs> Will, sleep tight. <laughs> Millicent, don't let the bed bugs bite. <laughs> Little Talia, 
Welcome to the Academy. community, we count on the most uniquely talented individuals to say the things we are most afraid to say. It's so funny. Um, and so there's like, there's a few things to say about this, but one is um, obviously the camera cuts away um, at the moment that I think we can presume um, we know there's a guess, you know, uh, not least because of that hilarious thing you're doing with your mouth <laughs> afterwards. Um, um, you want to tell us the context of this and why the camera uh, didn't show that? Uh, sure. So uh, this was from 1992, the pilot episode of the PBS show In the Life, which was the first gay, lesbian, bi, trans, queer, identified television show on network TV. And it was like a huge deal. And uh, they asked us to be on the show. And um, then, you know, they, well, you know, I guess in those times, we could begin to talk about queerness, but we could not show it. Okay. So, um, you know, which is not good theater. Okay. Show me, don't tell me. All right. <laughs> Um, so we were very mad at them. We were very mad at the producers. We went over and, um, had a meeting with them and yelled at them for censoring us. So, uh, it was a different time. It was a very different time. So we're going to look at a clip from, uh, from, uh, Marga and Carmelita, um, single wet female, uh, which I think did show and not tell. Um, yeah. and, I think, uh, and one of the things that it has in common, I think, with what we just saw is just this um, it's real physical comedy. And um, just sort of going back to the idea that 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 Deb Ray's and others of you picked up on about the the fact of and the use of the body on stage and how um, you really I think all of you as performers um, have have trained that instrument <laughs> um, one way or another um, and often to great comic effect. Can I um, say one thing before sure. we, uh, um, this was uh, in, inspired or uh, it, it, it was a takedown of a film called uh, Single White Female that some people may not know, but it was kind of that use, that titillation factor of, of using lesbian uh, undertones um, to, you know, to sell tickets by male directors. And so we took it, uh, we turned it around, and, um, and it actually is a piece um, that is, yeah, it's, it's really fun, and, and it's also about assimilation, but we don't spend too much time on that. <laughs> Okay. Uh, do you want to say anything else before we watch it, Carmelita, or shall we just watch? Just watch, and then I'll come back. And Okay, great. Uh, please roll it, Chris. <laughs> I got two words to use. Merengue. Merengue!
So, um, so, you know, just like Deb was saying, she was the Jewish, you know, in here, we were trying to figure out, oh, my God, at first, we, we had never worked together. We didn't even know that we could work together because Marga and I had a falling. We, we, that's, that's, uh, that's her thing. That's her thing. I was good. I was a good, I was a good one. But uh, it all happened yeah. when we were with uh, Alisa in Austin. Exactly, because we were doing um, a a um, the, the, a a festival there, uh, and so I, Marga and I got together. And we said, "Oh yeah, maybe we can work together." It was the first time we thought. And Jose Munoz also pushed us to work together. Said, "You two can both work together." And we're like, "I don't know," but we did, and it was like um, trying to figure out what we're doing. And so Marga got her. Um, Margaret got her uh, uh, her uh, kind of like character really right away. She was going to be hyper femme. So hyper femme. And then I didn't have a character. I was just really, my, you know, it's like, it's not working. And then I spoke to my sister. I'm not getting the character. I just don't know. And she said, why aren't you a foil to her? You be uber butch. Uber butch. That's right. That's what I have to be. Just a crazy butch weirdo you know but to the hilt because it's a horror so I, it was it really worked well both of us together and so we could talk about latinidad and also we could talk about gender you know femme butch male female it was all thrown in in a very queer way and david schweitzer who directed the show made sure that you know the sets were disgustingly pink all over I mean, absolutely pink. And I was wearing the orange of like a prisoner, you know? So it was like, visually, it was really great to watch because it was the queerness, you know, with the visuals thrown to the, to the max. And it was um, also um, sort of a, a Brechtian style of, of delivery, which I don't think I, but uh, Carmelita really nailed it when I see it. So we were never supposed to uh, address each other uh, by looking at it. We always had to address each other uh, by looking away. And, uh, and yeah, really the, 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 can I do the spoiler for the, the, yeah, it was that we were the same person. So it was like we were before Fight Club. That's what it was. And we were the same person who could not deal with being a Latina. So she became like, you know, this blonde. Or a butch. So it was her. I was the butch Latina that was in her. And you she was the real one. Trying to, trying to pass. Yeah. Yeah. And we got the tostones every, every day. Fresh tostones for the and clothes. Murray, yeah. And Murray Hill played the boyfriend. And we have film also to be part of it so yeah alisa you're muted you think I, like a year and a half of teaching on this platform <laughs> i wouldn't make that mistake thank you um so we are racing through the clock here um and there's like so much more to talk about and i meant to say this earlier um but you know, people watching who have questions. I think there's a chat you can put them in and I'll try to incorporate things as we go along or leave some time um, to the, the fast approaching end to include those. Um, so I'd like to do something now that I call the lightning round where, and I, I think all four of you should just unmute yourselves because I'm going to do this really fast. So I'm just going to ask you a question and you're going to answer it in like one sentence. Um, and we'll just go around. <laughs> um, okay, you up for it? We sure. each get the same question or yeah. we... Yeah, you okay. each get the same question. Just right. answer it in a, in a sentence and then somebody else will answer, okay? 
So here's the first question. What's something you miss about making work in the 1980s that's no longer possible or in any case, no longer part of your process? I miss the queer community and the uh, people of color community that was able to live uh, where the theaters are. I miss the clubs where you just went and did some demented thing. You had a few minutes, you were like a cultural migrant worker. You showed up with your stuff in a bag, threw it on the stage, talked for 10 minutes, got in a cab and went somewhere else. I, I um, love the idea that it was experimental and you were trying things out. You threw things at the wall. Some could stick, some cannot. But even that, that joy of like the mistake and the failures that would be later part of a better piece were absolutely, you know, food, absolute food. I totally miss the sub professionalism and the messes that we made. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, what's something you, um, as a writer and or as a performer, what's something you'd like to steal from one of your co-panelists? <laughs> I would love to steal um, uh, kind of like what I saw uh, in Split Bridges, which is a, a monologue that, you know, had the fire in my pocket because that fire in my pocket set a fire in my pussy. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so it, it, you know, it just was the wordsmith and the humor of uh, Marga and Mo, her incredible way of taking things and just layering in many, many ways. I would like to, I would like to steal Mo's calm and understated manner. And I'd like to steal Carmelita's Guayabera. Deb, I'm watching, I'm trying to figure out what I want, but your place is a blur, so I can't. Uh, <laughs> you're better this. off, you're better off. <laughs> I would like to steal Mo's performance of Susan Sontag. Every aspect of it, the gauze in front of her, the mysteries before her, I would like to steal the grace uh, that attended that performance, the depth of it and grace of it. I would like to steal all of your brains. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last question in this lightning round. As a feminist, and this is like, this is going to be hard to do this in one sentence. As a feminist, what are you most angry or worked up about right now? Go Giants. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, it's the same old shit. Like, women, ugh. We, misogyny, it's killing us. <laughs> oh, um, the current scandal of the Center Theater Group in uh, L.A.? Mm-hmm. Um, there are, uh, what, like uh, 5% uh, plays by women? Yeah. Brett Kavanaugh and Clarence Thomas can't sleep. I can't sleep. Brett Kavanaugh. Brett Kavanaugh. I like beer. You got a, you got a problem with sexism? Take it to the Supreme Court. Carmel, I hate you? TikTok. I hate it. I, I, I agree. I, I made a film in 1994 and we were doing whack and we were doing anti-abortion. We said, oh, when it comes out, nobody's going to really want to talk about this because it's going to be over. So it's going to be dated. But why not? OK, so I didn't mean for this to be such a downer, uh, though I should have uh. known. So um, I'm going to combine a couple questions that have come in from our viewers um, and and ask you whoever wants to take these um, first, you know, how your um, how, how your understanding and ideas of feminism have changed um, over the years you've been making work and what your challenges um, have been finding your voice on stage to um, address the things that you care about? And has, has, have those changed over time? Anybody? Well, one, in, one of the interesting things is that um, I'm an older person now. So in addition to those difficulties, that attend us as women now come the difficulties that attend us 
as women who are not young. Um, and so uh, I am committed fully to continuing my work. And that, I mean, just on the most pragmatic level, the fact that, you know, I'm a woman in my 60s makes that a lot more challenging. I think that also the time of the world we're living in now where the information is just, you know, bombarding you the whole time, which is really great in some ways, but it's like how to filter out. And so that is a challenge of how to, as a theater maker, as an artist, how do you keep going? What things can you use to really, you know, pump yourself up and, and really, you know, what radical women can become role models that you keep going and how do you teach the next generation? How do you pass the torch on? How do you teach in a way that it's via, you know, that these kids are going to be loving theater, making it and being a, a theater maker for a better world? I think the, uh, uh, the discussion also has, has broadened uh, from from when uh, I started in in what's you know what we know of as feminist theater, um, now it's really about upending the patriarchy, uh, upending uh, uh, racism, and so it's it's about alliances between feminism, uh, BIPOC, uh, uh, LGBTQ, uh, non-binary people. And uh, and sometimes we're all of that. So I think it's um, you know it's it's just vast, and I think that's that's a really good thing. I would say that um, the world, yes, has changed absolutely. Uh, we know way more about other people, and they know about us, and that's both wonderful and um, can be difficult when you're just trying to make a piece of theater. Uh, and I, I do want to um, give a shout out to WOW on this because when I started at WOW, it was predominantly white organization. And we talked a lot about, well, I guess at that point we called it diversity. I can't remember what the exact language was. And um, it took a long time. Like WOW is 40 years old now, over 40 years old. It took a long time to change, but it did. And if you go to a WOW meeting now, it is not predominantly white women. It is trans people and people of color. And that is an incredibly beautiful thing. And it is serving the community of people that make that work. And it's incredible. So it, change is possible. Okay, it can happen, but it takes time. And you gotta be able to disagree and stay in the same room. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay, great. Um, Mo did mention a, a, a couple of minutes ago your performance as Susan Sontag in the um, Builders Association. And, and that makes me think about how all of you have worked in different kinds of spaces. You know, WOW was formative for you, Lilith, um, for Margot Split, which is um, for Deb. And you've all gone on from those places to work in. Um, traditional theater spaces on college campuses and comedy clubs, you know, on Zoom. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the differences of um, making of both of the institutional differences and then also the kinds of work you've made, you know, you've acted in traditional plays or not so traditional multimedia plays. You've made solo work. You've made collective creation um, with other artists. Um, what are what are some of the differences um, in those processes? Are any driven by feminist principles? Um, and do you have a, a favorite way of working or favorite kind of space to work in? Right now I'm doing a show where um, I, I basically bring a box onto the stage and take my props out of it. So I think, um, you know, coming back from the 
pandemic, which is not quite over. Um, I think we just are, are, we're back to where we were in the eighties where we, you know, we just throw everything in a sack and do a show and then get the, get the hell out. Also like to give a shout out to Ellie Coven at Dixon place. Who's been, uh, you know, who's kept a lot of us up, raised a lot of us up and a lot of other women, um, uh, producers, feminist producers around the country, because when we, you know, when we didn't have theaters, there were just like nights that we could go and we could perform or somebody had a hookup in a university and, you know, and Sarah and Karen Jaime at Cornell. And then we were able to continue to make a living and survive as artists. Great. And that's right on cue because we just have an audience question asking how you were able to support yourselves um, mm-hmm. through all of this as well. And definitely the touring. A lot of you mentioned uh, touring in Europe early and then also uh, universities. I think so. Um, other takers on this uh, multi prong question? Day job. Had a day job. <laughs> uh, kind of always, always have. <laughs> okay. Um, Some kind and, of day job. Not, not all the time, but you know, episodically. So what's, what's the difference between working with Builders Association and the Five Lesbian Brothers? Yeah, the Builders is um, dealing a lot. Uh, well, all the work is uh, about, well, not about, but utilizes the technology that we have in our lives around us all the time now are very powerful technologies. The brothers don't, um, we don't, we don't, we're making, we're just making shows, <laughs> plays. Um, and so there we work in the brothers, we work a lot more with improvisation and it is really a feminist lateral process, right? So there's the five of us in a room and we um, write a show together. Um, and in the builders, it's a much bigger room. Uh, it's uh, more diverse along gender, sexuality lines. Um, but there still is a lateral decision making uh, an opinion, I'll say opinion making process. I mean, Marianne Weems, the director, is the decider in the end, but we are all invited into that process, and I consider that to be pretty feminist. Great. Uh, we have another question that just come in. Maybe I'll maybe I'll toss this one to you, Carmelita, because of your time at Intar, though it's not specifically a feminist space, uh, but you know something about manage managerial side of things maybe um the question is what kind of business models are most conducive to feminist practices what business models well um i <laughs> keep your props in a box and uh, be able to get out quick <laughs> i play Karl marx uh let me see a question of labor no uh i i think that in terms of business model that's something we have to look at because it's been very hard to be uh, a sustain, you know, a, a, an artist that sustains a career for a long period of time. So Mo has always had a job or sporadically. I have also, I used to have more of a full-time job. I had a job at Intar. Intar Theater was the first Latino theater. Um, and uh, it was really, you know, where I met Irene Fornes, who has taught so many people. She was an amazing, amazing artist and teacher and mentor to people. So, um, so these are spaces that not only have they, um, and, and now I have been working with Soho Rep, and at Soho Rep, it's, it's a very open space in terms of three women are the ones that are, are leading it. You know, there's a producer, there's an artistic producer, and there's, you know, a, a, an executive director. So all of these people laterally, you know, hire people, and we were hired actually, um, Eight BIPOC, you know, artists were hired to talk about what the theater is going to be, how to make it more inclusive, how not to just, you know, in terms of people of color, but also people of disabilities. So we had a whole and how do we bring in a more socially progressive agenda into the theater? How do we and we were being paid a salary with uh, health insurance because they wanted to test out what is it to give an artist, you know, for a whole nine months, you know, a salary. I think that that was an amazing thing. Can it be done all the time? Mm, probably not. But at least some people took it. And hopefully, just like, you know, I got a lot of things from WOW. I will pass it forward, you know, like um, like Deb, you know, was talking about all these people that have had, you know, uh, experimental theater groups, and, you know, all the feminists that have come before them. It's part of what they are. And Soho Rep was, you know, in a way, it's a very feminist space because it's the three women 
that are leading it. So I, I think that those kinds of ways of looking uh, in terms of even opening up the business model, how are we going to survive? How are we going to, you know, because uh, it's going to be, it's going to be a lot harder for some spaces to survive in New York. We've already seen the Lark, which was a development age, and, and the Soho also does, you know, develop work. So, so it's like trying to figure out developing work, giving, you know, money to artists, I'm part of NIFA, which is a New York Foundation for the Arts. How do you, how do you, you know, sustain a career? And, you know, uh, uh, so that's something to look at. That's, those are skills, business skills to give artists so that they continue. Is, is there a specific, I mean, Soho Rep, is there a specific feminist valence um, to, to that or to, you know, either on the business side or on the, on the creative side in um, any of the institutions or groups or processes that you're involved in? Um, I don't know what you're, what, uh, you're referring to. I, I know that they, when they pick, you know, people to work with, sometimes, you know, there's a lot of women and a lot of women of color and also men, but, you know, they've really done a, a great job in terms of hiring, you know, people of color um, and, and uh, supporting the work of people of color. You know, it's like I, I even, you know, uh, I'm working in a piece with Brandon Jacobs Jenkins, who's a black, you know, African-American, you know, uh, playwright uh, who I who I taught at NYU and we have throughout the years kept in touch. And now, ten years later, we're we're you know working together on a piece where we're exchanging persona. He's going to become me, a woman Latin X of a certain age, uh, and I am going to become an African, you know, man, you know, hot <laughs> of a different age. So it, it you know, so it's like what they choose is to really open up the space and uh -huh. be experimental with a lot of things. So I think that that kind of being experimental is also a very feminist in some ways idea of not having a fixed it's this it's you know uh -huh. okay great so we're we're very close to the um end of the time so i'm going to ask three more kind of quasi lightning round questions um one was one i was hoping we'd have plenty of time for but we don't so i'll ask you to just tell us very quickly carmelita you just did um what are you working on now I mean, Marga, you're running a show. Tell us a little oh. more about it. Oh, yeah. I, I, but I don't know that, uh, Carmelita, where can people listen to your podcast? Oh, yeah. <laughs> what a nice, what a, uh, Marga. Um, uh, Carmelita Tropicana in SoundCloud. Uh, yeah, it's wonderful. It's uh, amazing. And, I, and I'm kind of like a big uh, audiophile geek now. Um, I am, yeah, um, finally doing my first live performances uh, since um, theaters have started to reopen. It's still very weird. Uh, my piece is called, uh, I don't know if you have <laughs> noticed, it. it does kind of pop out in the blur uh, spanking machine uh, in uh, in uh, San Francisco right now at the Marsh Theater um, and um, and it is also something that I will probably do at a theater festival coming up uh, virtually uh, the uh, Latinx uh, Reencuentro 2021 in November so people want to see the film version of it uh, they can they can kind of just check that out um, and it's been it's been amazing you know I mean, to I've been really loving. I'm the only person who loves Zoom. I love it, and uh, but now that I'm on stage, it's very weird because I I still keep performing the width of a monitor, oh. um, and um, yeah, and and so that's it. After that, I'm going to be working on a radio play. Um, a children's play uh, called uh, Imaginary Friends. Great. Um, and now we're doing definite lightning round one sentence answers. Oh, Deb, what's, what's next for you? And Mo, what's next for you? Um, I am, uh, I have, I'm working on a commission from the Keene Theater. It's an audio play that's going to be performed live a number of times. So you have to straddle both worlds. I finished a play called Insurrection about my father's being blasted blacklisted during the McCarthy era and I perform my show on Zoom. Marga, it went to Zoom very graciously. It was supposed to open in theater. It's called uh, 
Just give me one half hour with my mother. I saw it. It was wonderful. Right. Oh, yeah, thank beautiful. you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm going to steal it. Oh. <laughs> Mo, it's all yours. yours. It's all yours. So, uh, yeah, the Five Lesbian Brothers are meeting together on Zoom for some togetherness across distance. Uh, hopefully, we'll make something, I hope. And uh, I'm working on a new piece with the Builders Association, which is about click workers on the Internet, and it is called I Agree to the Terms. And it's a, <laughs> it's a hybrid live uh, device remote performance. Great. Now, in two minutes, we're going to do three lightning round questions. You ready? Okay, question one. What advice do you have for younger feminist theater artists today? In one sentence or less. Well, um, be scrappy, be rigorous, cast the feminist net wide to drag in the travesties. Marga. Record yourself uh, if it's just on your phone and listen to uh, every performance afterwards. Deb. Honor a theater of desire. Do what you want. Do what you want. Life is so short. Do what you want. Uh, Carolina. Do what you want. Sometimes push yourself to do what you're really afraid to do. Because... Mm -hmm. Just like in the desire that you want to do something, there's also, oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> Very okay. Second, second uh, lightning round question of three. What advice or inspiration does the work of the new feminist generation have for you? Carmelita. Um, that they're doing it, that they're finding new ways. I mean, uh, 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 Tina Satter had this wonderful play that is taking something that's uh, a, a real event in history, doing interviews and putting it in a very theatrical form. And that's fantastic. I, uh, I appreciate the, uh, the use of, I, I guess, I, I have to admit, I, I appreciate finally uh, the use of, uh, of mixing technology with live performance. I'm, te I'm teaching a lot of, not teaching, I'm facilitating uh, creative thinking with some really, really smart kids at the university I teach at. And I am amazed that in the middle of a what I really think is a sociocultural revolution long overdue, they are rising to include each other, to hear each other, and to yearn for each other on the stage. Well, I am so inspired by all of the theater artists that are in the next panel. Plug, plug, plugging the next panel. But um, Tina and half straddle, Brooke and two-headed calf making amazing, amazing work. Thank you so much. Great. So I have a bunch more questions and I wish we could go on for a few more hours. Um, as, and as grateful as I am for the digital space that makes us able to have this conversation um, and for the eCornell platform and the people making it happen, I wish we could all now repair to the nearest, you know, restaurant and gab for a few more hours. Um, Anyway, this has been uh, enlightening and inspirational to me. Thank you, Carmelita Travacana, Deb Margolin, Marga Gomez, and Mo Angelos for sharing your time and thoughts I got you. and spirits with all of us um, and for the body of work that you've made and that you continue to make. And now um, I turn things back over to Jessica and Sue with um, my thanks for their final words. Muted, Sue. Sue, unmute. I want to thank the panelists. I was muted. Okay, thank you, panelists. Uh, it's all going to be, this video is uh, going to be on feministtheater.com uh, when it's uh, given to us. So keep looking at feministtheater.com for this video and for the next panel.
And Mo, thank you for that plug. The next panel, which is titled Performance in the Postwave Present, will be held on uh, Thursday, November 18th, um, 7 to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And I will have the pleasure of moderating that panel, and it will feature Brooke O'Hara of the Dyke Division of the Theater of a Two-Headed Calf, Tina Satter of Half Straddle, Haruna Lee, um, Aladrian C. Wetzel, and Kristen Cromwell of Two Strikes Theater Collective. And we hope to see you there. Bye.